I'm Josh Hammer. I'm Emily Jashinsky. And I'm Ben Weingarten. And this is NatCon Squad, where common good and common sense meet. NatCon Squad is produced by the Edmund Burke Foundation, the home of national conservatism. Subscribe now on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. So welcome back, everybody. Um, we have a full slate today. Um, we're going to come back to SCOTUS, uh, but we're going to start, uh, Ben's actually going to start us off with a, an unusual white pill. Um, so we're going to start off on a good take today. Uh, and then Emily is going to take us into kind of some, in, an interesting uh, discussion of cultural values in a divided society. And then Josh and I are going to finish it out talking about kind of the fallout from the SCOTUS leak, uh, both sort of in real life and also on Twitter. Uh, and as the two merge, uh, what emerges from that. So uh, with that, I'll kick it over to Ben. Thanks. Well, by happenstance, I am working on a reported piece right now. It may be out by the time this podcast comes out on the nascent backlash against woke capital. And in part, to understand the backlash against woke capital, you have to understand why it is that woke capital is so big, powerful, and influential. And in this piece, to come out, I talk about, uh, among others, probably the the ten trillion dollar gorilla in the room, which is BlackRock. BlackRock being the world's largest asset manager with ten trillion dollars under management, and BlackRock and several other asset managers, namely Vanguard and State Street collectively have over $20 trillion under management. And with those funds uh, of investors that they have put into basically the entire marketplace, they own collectively something like more than 20% of the stock on average of the average S&P 500 company. What do they do with that power? Well, led by BlackRock, they have influenced the politics within companies. And one of the ways they do this, which I think is probably little appreciated, is that each year, there are non-binding stockholder resolutions that can be put forth at the annual meetings for people who own around more than $2,000 in a stock. And increasingly, left-wing activist groups and leftist activist investors, activist investors who happen to be leftists as well, have been lodging these resolutions that aim to push companies essentially towards wokeism. Uh, under the rubric of ESG, environmental socialism, uh, socialism, social and governance standards, basically pushing companies to go green, to get to net zero in terms of emissions, uh, impose essentially diversity quotas, not in terms of viewpoint on their boards uh, and the like. So this is one massive lever, the market power of these financial companies led by the major asset management companies to influence corporate America and essentially do an end run around democracy, at least as critics, and, and I'm one of them, would suggest. Well, Vivek Ramaswamy is, among others, who is leading a counter to the Black Rocks of the world. And just this week, launched a new platform, which will be an asset manager, an alternative asset manager, essentially, to woke capital and combat what's been termed stakeholder capitalism, the idea that you should use companies to essentially benefit the cause of left-wing activists for in, in, and to replace that with excellence capitalism, investing in the energy companies that the big financial behemoths now discriminate against and a whole slew of other companies as well. And so Ramaswamy has launched this fund and in a, in a press release, it, it says, to depoliticize corporate America and replace essentially stakeholder capitalism with excellence capitalism. So this is an alternative market mechanism to provide competition to the big asset managers and begin to fight back in a very direct way against the takeover of corporate America of the woke. So I think it's a news story that's worth highlighting on the merits. It's an interesting part of a nascent backlash that goes well beyond just financial services uh, obviously, as well to numerous states, Arizona, for example, is potentially pursuing uh, antitrust violations when it comes to woke capitalist push against oil companies. There have been a whole slew of state government officials who have been seeking to break their pension funds from investing in ESG investments and putting their money into entities like BlackRock's funds. This is a way that people have unwittingly been funding companies that might loathe them. And there are many levers now being pulled to try to combat this more than $10 trillion behemoth in the room of woke capital. So uh, I think wanted to start on a sunny note and also put it to uh, the group, you know, what's your take on this? Do you think this is meaningful? Or do you think there's more to come here? 
I guess my first question, I mean, I like, I, I think this is all good. These are all good developments, but I guess my first question is, can we actually out BlackRock BlackRock, right? Like, it's just, it's so big. <laughs> and like, do you think that this is possible? Maybe the Ben, you can follow up on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, I mean, the positive thing here is that Vivek Ramaswamy and his partners have gotten Peter Thiel, Bill Ackman, one of the most prominent uh, as fund managers, hedge fund managers on Wall Street, uh, the CEO, I believe, of Cantor Fitzgerald, and a slew of other pretty prominent people as some of the initial investors in this. So hopefully that would lead others, because there's definitely a herd mentality on Wall Street, to come into this space and flood it with funds. They probably, from a purely rational capitalist kind of perspective, would say, look, I'm diversifying my portfolio by putting some money behind something like this. But look, some kind of pushback is better than none. You yeah. know, assuming that the SEC permits them to raise these funds and doesn't discriminate against them, although maybe that would backfire on the SEC too if they did discriminate in some form or fashion here. Uh, I think it's all to the good. I'm for an all of the above approach. And that must include funds like these. But to your point, it's obviously incredibly difficult when you have an asset manager like BlackRock who dominates in terms of retirement accounts, 401ks, pensions, et cetera, has ex-employees sitting in prominent positions within the Biden administration. And then the SEC in large part, which has put forth, for example, these very onerous, this proposed climate disclosure rules that could have massive effects. Well, those, dis those disclosure rules were lobbied for and built on standards that BlackRock's endorsed. So they kind of have us checked at every single level. But that said, you have to start somewhere. And so I think this is all to the good and maybe there'll be a copycat element to this. That's a great point. So funny enough, a little over a year ago now, uh, late April, 2021, I was sitting in Chicago with, uh, at a restaurant overlooking the river with two dear friends of mine talking about launching something very similar to this. And we ended up kind of doing some investor meetings for, we had a kind of a polished 15, 16 slide deck this past fall. One of those prospective investor meetings actually was with Vivek Ramaswamy, who at that time told us he was looking at doing something similar. His final product is a little different than what we envisioned. Our own project is actually sitting on the back stove. So I'm not alleging anything nefarious here, obviously, but I'm, I'm, I'm just happy that someone is actually doing what we had talked about in our own kind of investor group. Um, it, it, this obviously is drastically needed. Um, it is years overdue, but it's better late than never very much so. Obviously, the list of investors that Ben said, people like Teal, Bill Ackman, these are kind of heavy hitters in the industry. I mean, Vivek obviously has the has the book Woke Inc. This kind of like is his topic. So we'll see. I mean, you know, obviously the, the question is, you know, who is going to sign up? I mean, are they going to get major pension funds and in, in red states, things of that? I mean, what kind of like major investors? But it, 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 this is so overdue. I mean, there is a fundamental mismatch between what Vanguard, BlackRock and State Street are doing and what the media investor wants out of his or her retirement funds and their investments more generally speaking. So whether he has a specific right idea in mind, I'm, I, I'm not entirely sure. But I, I, at this point, it's very much worth kind of throwing like you know, paint at the wall, seeing what sticks. And if you, you know, I was looking at his Twitter a little bit on the day that he launched, it looked like he was getting like a ton of great applicants or very qualified people who are kind of sick of the woke BS from inside Vanguard or BlackRock. So uh, all good stuff. So, I mean, I, I'm happy to see someone kind of get out of the gate and lead on this front. Yes, this is very much not my area at all, but it is one of these parallel institutions uh, that's popping up. And I think in this case, what's particularly crucial is uh, something that everyone has highlighted in their comments, except for Rachel's, which were brief um, and mercifully so. But uh, I would say it was the, the reality that these are people who know what they're doing in this space and are not just trying to throw money at a problem, but like they actually know this area. Um, they have the expertise. That's what's particularly interesting to me because conservatives have um, for years looked at spaces like Hollywood, looked at spaces like tech and just said, we, we know we need to do something here, but we don't have anybody from that space, from that industry who can do it. Um, and so I think increasingly as we've seen people from those spaces be willing to put money into these projects, that is really interesting to me because they sort of have the know-how to, uh, to bite at the heels um, of the big guys. Um, and, and so I, I do think that is something really interesting about this product. And I'll mention when we're, as we're taping this on Wednesday, a new 
competitor to the Chamber of Commerce was announced. And uh, I think some people are cheering it on, but I looked at what they'd said. I think they rolled it out to Axios. And it was these like platitudes about socialism, which everybody here uh, and certainly everybody in like the national conservative sort of sphere, uh, with the exception of like maybe a couple people <laughs> is in agreement that socialism is very, very bad. And in fact, very, very dangerous. Uh, I, I'm sure detractors can find something here or there to undermine that. But like everybody agrees that socialism is, is socialism is dangerous. It's just instead of, you know, taking what the Chamber of Commerce is doing, the sort of woke Chamber of Commerce right now and saying, how can we be better stewards of our, our capital and our labor they're literally just saying like, uh, you know, let's let's cut taxes um, and and maybe that's not how it'll pan out. But from the announcement, just talking about, you know, just just absolutely um, raging against socialism. It sounds to me like that's not going in the right direction. Um, so it is kind of interesting to see as these these parallel groups pop up, um, which ones get it and which ones don't. And it sounds like uh, the the sort of effort to undercut uh, BlackRock is heading in the right direction. So it is a it's a good it's a happy story to talk about. Thanks, Ben. I try once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ben started us off on a light note. So Emily, I'm relying on you to take this down a dark dark path so, somewhere really <laughs> dark we are in fact going somewhere really dark um I'm, I'm sure production will put this tweet up on the screen but actually uh, there was a, an interesting conversation that somehow got started on twitter over pizza hut um and it turned out this this uh twitter account called vocal distance did a fascinating thread actually on why it's not uh trivial or silly to kind of long for the days um, when Pizza Hut was almost like a, a, a watering hole um, and a, a gathering space. And you know, you'd go there after your soccer games, you would go there with your family. Uh, they, ha they had table service, of course, um, and they had video game machines, um, the buffet, which I don't think any Pizza Huts offer their buffet anymore, but I will just say that was the best deal in town. The, the Pizza Hut lunch buffet, incredible value uh, for your dollar, but I don't know, I don't think they do that anymore. Anyway, so as people were sort of lamenting the decline of Pizza Hut, um, it was taken as a, a symbol of American decline. And Vocal Distance did a really, really interesting Twitter thread saying there are legitimate reasons to see the decline of, of Pizza Hut, which is mostly a takeout business now um, and is, is not, it's sort of a far cry from what it used to be in a lot of communities, which was uh, a sit down restaurant. Uh, that had this sort of, it, it had its own very specific, unique appeal, right? Like there was very much a, uh, a an aesthetic um, that Pizza Hut had that was so cheesy, um, no pun intended, and so like middle brow, but people loved it because it was distinct. Um, and it was, you know, a place where you could go with your family or your friends on a Friday night, it's sort of like how we used to see malls, uh, you know, not there were gathering places, sort of cornerstones of the community. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, we have to love and revere Pizza Hut, but I did think that was a, an interesting point that Vocal Distance made. At the end of the thread, Vocal Distance tweeted what I found to be an extremely depressing picture of a young boy sitting on a beanbag chair playing what appears to be N64. Um, he's got all of these wires hooked up. Um, and we can put this on the screen. He's got all these wires hooked up to his uh, TV. He's playing a video game. And his room is plastered with posters um, of comic books, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, Turtles, Indiana Jones. Um, and outside, you can see it's a beautiful day. There's a 7-Up can on the table. Um, it, so to me, this is the vocal distance tweets that culture, as mass produced as it was, gave us an affordable, quote, cultural space to inhabit as we made families, enjoyed prosperity, and came of age. It was home. This was a good way to grow up, accompanying that picture. I responded, this is a better way to grow up, but perhaps not a good one. Indoor isolation, surrounded by corporate marketing. We had comforts and resources beyond what anyone could imagine, but that came with problems we did not foresee or adequately address. So that's the reason I want to talk about this with everyone, as silly as it sounds. It's very, very interesting because we do look back um, on the 90s, on the 80s, uh, some people on the early aughts, 
as this time where we all sort of shared cultural touchstones. It feels calm in comparison to the 60s and to the 2010s. Um, it feels like that noise was at a, a minimum, you know, even with 24 hour news and the burgeoning internet, it felt like that cultural noise was, was at a minimum. And I think it, that's true. I think it was better for so many different reasons. But the technology has moved so quickly that I think we idealize um, things that in and of themselves were questionable, right? Like video games, when it's a nice day outside, video games are great cultural touchstones, especially when there was less choice and everyone was playing Mario Kart and Zelda and whatever. Um, and that's the same thing with like when everybody was watching uh, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like or Power Rangers, whatever it was, um, we did share cultural touchstone, touchstones more often. But that doesn't mean that sort of saturating yourself in, in corporate marketing is a, a good in and of itself. So that's where I think that not to be too particular, but that wording just irked me and I thought it was very telling. This was a good way to grow up. Well, maybe good in comparison to how kids are growing up now um, with the lights turned off, scrolling TikTok um, until they're able to fight their anxiety and, and fall asleep. Um, good comparatively, sure, but good in and of itself. I still don't think we've actually truly reckoned um, with the, the corporate advertising and the the way that these things were brought into our lives, like Pizza Hut in moderation is fine, but they served it at my middle school three days a week. Probably not great. <laughs> um, so it, there's some of these things that as we pine for a better time, I think it's, it's crucial for us to consider what is a good, um, what is virtuous as we're sort of uh, rethinking, I think the conservative project. You know, it's interesting. I think the Pizza Hut example is so compelling on a number of levels because um, some the older millennials that are hosting this show may remember Book It. If you guys remember the band, by this, I just mean Emily won't remember because she's too young. But the Book It certificates that you would get for like reading books at school that you could exchange for like a personal pan pizza. Can, you couldn't even, so it was sort of like a community element. It was a community hub because everybody going, you know, if you grew up in a small town like I did, everybody going to the local public school, would you'd see each other at Pizza Hut, you know, with our Book It certificates. We don't even have that now because we can't even agree on the books that should be in public school. Right. So like, you know, reading Babysitter's Club is is no longer, you know, possible because you have to read about gender ideology. You know, it's just so it, there's a fracturing, I think, on on certain multiple levels that you can read into sort of the Pizza Hut metaphor. But it's interesting because, you know, I think as the right approaches this question, I think very often we try to make policy based on nostalgia a little bit for for the 90s. And I claim to be very nostalgic for the 90s. Um, and I run into this a lot with like internet policy, for instance, right? We, we don't make policy for what is, we make policy for what we think it, you know, people who are still stuck in sort of the internet of the 90s, which was actually a great time, you know, and led to a lot of internet exceptionalism for very good reasons. If you guys remember, the internet at that point was like very decentralized. It was community moderated. It was not monetized, right? compared to the internet now, which is a series of, you know, vertically integrated walled gardens that are premised on addiction, right? A 14 year old trying to explore his space and learn about, you know, whatever on the internet and encounter like friends uh, with like-minded experiences is much, much more likely to get sucked into an, algor uh, an algorithmically driven, you know, rabbit hole of doom basically <laughs> than they are to actually have that good experience. So, you know, I do think that, you know, when we think about our shared cultural, cultural values, we have to have them, I think, as a normative that we want to achieve. But at the same time, I think we have to recognize that we live in a much more fractured state. And I think the right, in many cases, is still trying to push back and, and legislate in many cases, like it, like it is still the 90s without recognizing how far we've come. Yeah, I, I think Emily's point here is is very well taken. Uh, funny enough, I was actually in Wichita, Kansas this past weekend, which I think is where Pizza Hut was actually headquartered or where, where it was founded. I not, mean, not headquartered, it's now a Yum Brands product, I think, but it was it was founded in Wichita back in like the 1950s or something like that. Um, I want to come at this from a slightly different perspective because I was thinking about this a lot recently. When I was, re I was in Chicago a few weeks ago and I saw like in downtown Chicago in the River North neighborhood, this like big blaring plus size model advertisement. I don't remember like who it was for, or maybe it was like Victoria's Secret or something. And it was just very jarring. And like, I looked to my girlfriend and I was like, is, 
is this like a good thing? And I think I think the obvious agreement was that it's not a good thing. And, you know, Pizza Hut, restaurants like that, I mean, look, I like Rachel, I very much have like very fond childhood memories, the late 90s, early 2000s and whatnot, and places like Pizza Hut, Domino's, whatever, definitely play into like that nostalgia and that lore. But I think a, a lot of us of this certain demographic in this generation, more generally speaking, have these memories of kind of fast food and not uh, not healthy food products in general. And I guess the angle that I would approach this this topic this question from is one, frankly, of obesity and what and what and what people like Roger Scruton would talk about as objective beauty and the need to kind of still get at a notion in society of objective goods and objective beauty. More generally speaking, it's been a little bit of a late motif in this podcast. Going back to when we started this, I remember we did like a um, a segment on architecture and kind of the need to kind of strive for objective beauty there. But you know, America has a massive obesity problem. We have a problem with the proliferation of fast food with chains like Pizza Hut. And we, I think we really need as conservatives to start digging in a little more deeply as to what kind of a pro-nutrition, like pro-lifestyle public policy agenda looks like. Because it wasn't that long ago that you know Sarah Palin was getting up there with the what was it, 32 ounce, 72 ounce, whatever the heck it was, big gulp. And, you know, conservatives were like blindly like cheering, rah, 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 rah. I mean, and, you know, I, I think in retrospect, that probably looks a little silly. I think our priorities in that were a little misguided to be. Um, so I'll start with saying that this is, th these cultural experiences are a little alien to me as a New Jersey suburban knight who would never have been caught dead eating at a pizza hut uh, in his childhood. Although, to be fair, there's plenty of dominoes to be had and uh, video game extravaganzas. Um, but no, but I will say in, in all seriousness, there are a lot of important elements to this. I and mean, one of them is the notion of shared cultural touchstones that brings to mind for me, uh, Charles Murray's coming apart where he talks about the fact that in the past, there were all of these sort of, uh, socializing civil society venues where people from all walks of life got together and could set aside differences. And also that those shared cultural experiences created, of course, a shared culture, something that the technologies that we use today, of course, cut completely against. They atomize our culture and really balkanize society. So that's one aspect of it. Um, in terms of the consumerism, I kind of see both sides. Yeah, it's, it's somewhat dystopic on the one hand that it's like everything in a person's room is branded in such an over-the-top way in what's depicted there. Um, but on the other hand, it, it'd be a lot easier to deal with a wholeheartedly consumeristic society if the brands themselves were not really vehicles for uh, ideology and indoctrination. And that's one of the things that, going back to woke capital, one of the problems that we've seen is that every element of American life has been corrupted. And basically, it does really represent an end run around a Republican system of government where political issues are mediated in the arena of politics, not in every single aspect of life. And so to that extent, I mean, I think we all wish we could go back to a prior generation. Every generation thinks that the one that came before it, uh, I, I think a lot of people think that the generations before it were better than the current ones um, and were biased. And there's probably some recency bias there, but it certainly was a better America when you didn't get a side of critical race theory with your French fries. And that's where we are today, unfortunately. All right. So on those two topics, Josh, you want to take us back to uh, the drama du jour at SCOTUS? Yeah. So let's pick up where we kind of left off last week's episode. We'll close the podcast with those with two segments roughly about the fallout from that. So as of this recording, we still don't know the identity of the leaker, which I have to say I am actually really surprised by um, because we are talking here about a very small sample uh, sample size, a possible Leakers, and I, I just genuinely thought that they would have gotten to the bottom of it by now, frankly. Um, I, I guess the marshal of the U.S. Supreme Court is not as competent as Louis Mensch thought in that tweet from years ago. Uh, I'm not sure, honestly, the extent to which the FBI or anyone else is involved. It seems like they're not involved. But regardless, um, you know, we're recording this on Wednesday, May 11th. This morning, there was yet another article of Politico with the same byline, Josh Gerstein, who seems to have another leak. Uh, it is probably the same leaker. The leaker, if anything, feels emboldened. And I guess it's possible it's a different leaker, but it reads to me like it's the same leaker who confirmed to Josh Gerstein that the five justices who joined Justice Alito's draft opinion in the Dobbs case to overturn Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey have not deviated. But since then, in the, in the week and a half or so, since this leak came out, we've just seen one parade of horribles after the other, frankly. And I think the most galling thing are these images coming across American screens, not just the fact that the Supreme Court felt compelled to um, erect this eight foot high 
uh, someone imposing fence outside of its building, uh, you know, guy, if God forbid someone were to try to like storm it or try to firebomb or something. But the images really that I think are just genuinely galling, of course, are the ones uh, of these protesters, to put it mildly, it's probably the most flattering thing you could call them. Mob, I think, would be the more accurate term. Just outside the homes of Justices Alito, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Kavanaugh, at least. I mean, maybe there's been like a stray protester or, or, or two outside of, of, of the other homes as well. To say nothing, of course, what we've seen really all throughout the country, there was a pro-life group in Madison, Wisconsin, whose office was, uh, I mean, it looks like an act of arson, frankly. I mean, they're still investigating it. I heard rumors they found a Molotov cocktail there, cocktail there. it burned down. There was an ominous message, a disgusting message that was spray paint on the walls of this facility. It said, if abortion is not safe, then neither are you. We've seen in churches throughout the country. There was a Catholic church recently out in Los Angeles where these uh, what would only be called satanic forces, frankly. I mean, I mean, these rabid pro-abortion, pro-Antifa, Marxist-style folks kind of marching in in the middle of of mass. And we really just it's, it seems like whenever we can't reach a new low, we have reached a new low. <laughs> um, but one thing that I've been talking about now for a while. You know, it might have been our friend Mike Davis who first discovered this. I'm not sure who kind of first got this out there. But as the case may be, there actually is a federal statute that is directly on point here. Um, So I'm just going to read it. It's 18 U.S. Code Section 1507, quote, whoever with the intent of interfering with, obstructing, or impeding the administration of justice or with the intent of influencing any judge, juror, witness, or court court officer in the discharge of his duty, pickets or parades in or near a building housing a court of the United States or in or near a building or residence occupied or used by such a judge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why, for the love of God, why is the Biden DOJ not invoking this statute? Why is Merrick Garland and, and his DOJ and his line attorneys, why are they not just doing something to try to disincentivize these protesters and these mobsters. And I think the reason, obviously, and I'll I'll hand over to you guys on this thought, but my two cents is that the reason is obvious, which in this case, the mobs obviously are in cahoots with the ruling class. The ruling class now is necessarily, the the analogy that I've seen kind of Saur Ramari draw in some of his recent tweets and his column, I think this is right, what the modern Democratic Party is starting to look like, frankly, is what Hezbollah looked like kind of in the Middle East and in Europe, where you have the so-called military wing and the so-called political wing. And it looks a lot to me like that's what's happening with the Democratic Party, where the political wing at best is kind of just winking, winking to the military wing, but they're certainly not going to prosecute, it seems like. So it's just appalling stuff. But um, I'm not sure if you guys think I'm being a little overdramatic here or maybe not. Well, I think even worse than not, I mean, on par with not prosecuting is the fact that yesterday, Tuesday, Jen Psaki was asked about this and she said, oh, we encourage people to continue to protest outside the justice's home. You know, even giving her the benefit of the doubt that she didn't understand the federal statute (laughs) or understand that this is a criminal act, like that's egregious, that the White House would be sort of lending its tacit endorsement to what we've seen you know, at these protests, which themselves, you know, appear to at least violate the statute, but they're, you know, hurling or screaming obscenities, you know, kind of with the attempt to, or with the intent to intimidate, um, you know, sitting justices of of the Supreme Court. And I think, you know, it's interesting. I think Saurabh also made this point in his column. It's like, well, why wouldn't the left be doing this, right? They did this for two years, um, you know, and they've gotten away with it, you know, beginning in 2020 when they started burning cities. Uh, you know, after the death of George Floyd, and and they got what they wanted, right? They sort of changed corporate America's tact uh, towards issues they say they care about. They made a hell of a lot of money, uh, and you know, they they got congressional Democrats to like kneel in the rotunda, right, <laughs> on behalf of the cause that they said they support. So, you know, how they are evolving, I think you can't divorce that from the fact that this behavior has been incentivized. And is, if it's not prosecuted and it's not dealt with handily, it will continue. This is now how we rule our country through the mob and through threats and actual violence. Yeah, I'll say, I think that's one of the, the weird things that I've noticed. No, it's not weird. One of the interesting things I've noticed um, in the time since that uh, the, the leak is how many people on the left um, there is a wing of the left that is increasingly radical and truly like no longer believes in the Supreme Court. And to the extent they do, they actually want to like completely undercut it um, and just b- make it basically another branch of uh, democracy instead of a, a sort of branch of a Republican government. 
But there are a whole lot of people on the left who seem to have no idea that the Supreme Court is anti-democratic and it is supposed to be. And that is a, a design in our system, not a flaw in it. That is a feature, not a bug. And for very good reason. Um, and I feel like we've beaten our culture has just created this reverence for the word democracy, that anything that is not pure democracy strikes people in this very sort of facile way, because we do such a bad job educating people in this country about our system of government um, into how things are supposed to work. And so, you know, uh, people should be able to protest. I don't think any of us would disagree with that. We're all free speech um, people and we have made that very clear time and again, but it is in the case of the courts, um, why the leak itself has been so problematic is that you know this is what you're going to get and you will never be able to take that out of the minds of the justices and the clerks who are litigating uh, these huge high profile cases um, for years and years to come. Um, and, and we pray that everybody is safe um, and continues to be safe, but this is exactly why. I mean, you cannot put the genie back in the bottle. This has already happened. Um, and that's exactly why uh, we were concerned about it uh, because we knew this would happen. And so again, I pray that everybody remains safe. Um, we don't know that that will be the case yet, though, um, and and this is exactly why, because the sort of leftist protesters have said explicitly in a New Yorker article that they are in attempting to scare the S out of the justices, and that's the, the purpose of their protests, which if you're pro-abortion, I understand exactly why you would want to do that, um, but that's why whoever leaked this is disgusting um, and has really undermined our our institution, the court as an institution. Well, on the point about the ignorance in the American public of our system, I would say that's purposeful. This is by design. This is what our education system has wrought and it's by design because it is aimed at total political dominance, not the free republic that we're supposed to be. Um, I'm, I'll jump around. So first on Josh's uh, sort of rhetorical question of like, where's the beef with the leaker? A, a few follow-up questions would be, do they actually know who the leaker is? Because it's possible they know who the leaker is and they're sitting on it. And if they're sitting on it, why would they be sitting on it? And at what point would they release the name? If they haven't figured it out, how incompetent are the people looking into this, given how closed the loop should be in terms of the potential leakers? And then the last point is for, again, and I, I've been critical in the past and I'll probably be critical in the future again, for Mr. Institution Protecting Chief Justice, how have you not put down the final ruling here? Because every single day that goes on without putting out that ruling, the chances of something horrible happening continue to go up. And maybe that will happen irrespective of the timeline, because if the ruling does come down consistent with the draft opinion of Justice Alito, then of course the left is going to explode. Uh, but that, of course, you know, the court should not make its decisions based upon whether the left is going to explode or not. And certainly to diffuse the institution imperiling act of the weaker, it should have put the ruling out immediately and said, we will not be intimidated. We will go about our work. Um, so all that aside, you know, in terms of the, the kind of hypocrisy here, of where's the DOJ, where's the FBI? I think this is precisely the point. It's precisely the point that their side can act with total impunity and they will hold Americans they don't like and who disagree with them on issues to a completely different standard, of course, undermining our, our justice system, the rule of law and undermining democracy. How can you pretend to care about defending democracy when you are essentially incentivizing, consenting to the mob rule that is clearly going on here, the threats to justice at the face of a mob, which means you have no justice system anymore. So I think this episode is shameful from the beginning, from the jump. As I said, I think last week, the leak itself was an act of naked intimidation because it was clear that it would lead to precisely what we've seen. And the, the heightening of the double standards, the injustice in this country really does threaten to tear it asunder. I mean, of all the problems, of all the things that at our core really stick in our craw, I think towards the top of the list and maybe at the top has to be the fact that there's one set of rules for the ruling class and one set of rules for everyone else, unfortunate enough to live under its thumb. So on that note, kind of transitioning to my related topic, which sort of takes the broad uh, segment of 
the population that's like perpetuating violence. And I think to Josh's point, you know, when, about them being in cahoots with the ruling class um, and nailing it down to the microcosm of Twitter, <laughs> which is sort of my beat these days. Um, but I have a piece up at the New York Post uh, that went up on Tuesday that basically looks at the contrast in just how Again, you know, Twitter, which drives our national narrative, how Twitter as a platform is treating overt, you know, calls to violence from the left uh, in many cases um, against, you know, pro-lifers, against the country, against the institution of the, of the Supreme Court. And specifically, you know, people may be familiar at this point with the Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, tweeting out that, you know, this, this ruling, you know, even though it's a draft opinion, represents a call to arms. Uh, you know, for the LGBTQ plus community, and we will not let our rights go without a fight. So two things there I want to point out, you know, the left has just, um, you know, not just the, the calls to violence, they have just spread so much misinformation about what this ruling actually does. This idea that somehow, you know, all these other rights are now threatened if Roe is overturned has been, is explicitly refuted in the opinion itself. Alito makes very clear that this is cabined specifically to abortion, does not affect sort of cases outside of that. And moreover, this was elucidated in an exchange between Scott Stewart, the Solicitor General of Mississippi, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor at oral arguments in December. So this attempt to sort of take, uh, you know, uh, out of and stretch out of context the the effect this ruling will have. Can you imagine, like, where are the fact checkers? Right, the the right like says one random thing and gets fact checked into oblivion. The left is literally just able to do this, uh, you know, with impunity on Twitter. But I think more specifically. To the point that we were just talking about, the sort of threats to violence. So there was, it, this is coming not just from Democratic politicians, but blue check accounts all over Twitter are tweeting out, burn it down, right? You had Ian Milheiser famously, you know, sort of the, one of the leading uh, senior columnists at Vox, basically saying, was one of the first ones to, to put out this call, burn it down, burn down the Supreme Court, burn down the country. And, and this is proliferated. And compare this again to the reasoning Twitter issued for banning Donald Trump. If you remember this, if you actually go back and read uh, the rationale that Twitter policy put out, the two tweets they flagged were so anodyne from Donald Trump that it required them to contort themselves uh, into a pretzel to say, oh, well, we have to consider these tweets, uh, which I'm not going to read them both, but one of them is, one of them literally that got him banned from Twitter is, quote, to all of those who have asked, I will not be going to the inauguration on January 20th, end quote. That was one of the tweets that got him banned. Why? Because Twitter decided to read these tweets into the broader context of events and to assume that these would be interpreted in a certain way by his followers. Because in the second tweet they cite, uh, he used the term American patriots. And Twitter said, well, people will interpret that you know, in a very specific way. It was so absurd on its face. But if you take that rationale and you look at what's being allowed to circulate on this platform now, the, the bias is just incredible, right? The, the lack of care, uh, you know, the, the, the hammer that they threw down on, on Trump, on every, everyone on the right for years. We have literal threats to violence. We have Facebook still allowing an account for Ruth sent us, which is this leftist extremist group that published the home addresses of Supreme Court justices. Yet, you know, if you write a, a story about Patrice Kalor, the head of uh, Black Lives Matter, purchasing million dollar mansions, you can't circulate that on Facebook because that violates their personal identifying uh, policy or whatever. So I know that the hypocrisy of big tech is a very well-worn territory at this point, but I do think that in this particular um, episode of it, it is, it is really, really galling. Because not only do we have the social media companies in line with the people who are calling for the protests, which are resulting in violence in many cases, but you have Democratic politicians who refuse to even uh, condone it, or I'm sorry, like reject it completely. They, they will not denounce it, right? At, at most, they can say, oh, vague, vague hand-waving about saying, uh, you know, being peaceful. So, I, you know, it's an open question. If Elon Musk can solve this problem, I don't know. But in the meantime, this con these content moderation decisions are fueling I think the unrest and and the again overt acts of violence that you're seeing across the country, and I just think it's I mean ridiculous, although completely expected at this point. So I guess I have three quick takes. Um, one is I find it a little humorous, and this is a slightly cheeky thing I'm about to say, 
um, that the LGBT community cares so much about an abortion ruling potentially being overturned for biological reasons that I don't necessarily feel the need to spell out. But I think what she is allegedly getting at is kind of like a stare decisis point, right? So uh, let's kind of go back to, to like stare decisis 101. So personally, I, 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 as, I, as I've said before, I actually agree with Justice Thomas and stare decisis, at least as it pertains to the U.S. constitutional system, which is a very straightforward argument that when there was a clear conflict between the Constitution and precedent, you err on the side of the Constitution, period. But the point is that Justice Gorsuch on the current court is really the only current justice who has clearly kind of telegraphed that he fully agrees with Justice Thomas's view of stare decisis. The other even conservative justices do have this kind of multi-part balancing test. And one of like the old school kind of Scalia-inspired components of a stare decisis balancing test is always quote unquote reliance interests. Now, the thing, as Alito explains very carefully and thoroughly in his leaked draft opinion, reliance interests don't play a role in abortion because simply having prior had an abortion under the Roe regime 15, 20 years ago does not, that, that is not a reliance interest. That act is done. But in the context of marriage, while I have you know, vocally and publicly opposed to Bergefell and hope that it is overturned, when you kind of get to the issue of doling out marriage licenses and lifestyle decisions that have been made, if you except that stare decisis has this kind of reliance interest components, that, that's fundamentally a different calculation. So from their perspective, I, I, I frankly would not be as worried given the current composition of the court pending some, some drastic changes. But the only final thing I want to say is, I, I think for certain kind of, um, you know, viewers from like the Media Matters crowd, if by chance they listen to this podcast, they might hear folks like Rachel and me talking about how, you know, we want free speech, but then like we don't want some. They might, they might say that, oh, we're being hypocrites, whatever. No, we're, we're actually really not. Um, I, I think a lot of us have been consistent in calling for a First Amendment standard as, as far as what should be required to not be censored on Twitter. And even under current First Amendment law, going back to Brandenburg versus Ohio in 1969, imminent lawless action incitement is not permitted. And, you know, if you if you go back to the previous segment, 18 U.S. Code 1507 is lawless action. So imminently trying to encourage people to commit a lawless action would be verboten under that First Amendment standard on Twitter. Well, and I'll add, this is exactly why Elon Musk is right to say that he wants to use the simplest, the best um, first, uh, the best standard for content moderation, which is the First Amendment. I mean, surprisingly, we have spent decades, hundreds of years litigating what constitutes free speech through the greatest system of Republican government that has ever existed on the face of the earth. And it has produced some absolutely excellent guidelines. They are there for every company to use. And I understand why content moderation is extremely difficult for companies in this climate where you're constantly faced with harassment, where, and it is a very real concern, advertisers are constantly faced with Twitter harassment, social media harassment um, by small leftist vocal minorities who don't want to advertise next to a platform that lets David Duke or uh, someone on it. Now, those same leftist idiots do not care if the Ayatollah is on it, but David Duke, um, they will say, shut the platform down. And so I do understand why it's a difficult question for some of these companies to answer, especially ones that don't have a lot of involvement in politics and they aren't here in Washington and they they're just trying to navigate these extremely difficult uh, scenarios, but we have a First Amendment. So all you need to have is a stomach to just like, by the way, uh, politicians punted for years on Roe because they didn't want to actually say something pro-life. They would just say, uh, well, you know, we have Roe v. Wade and that settled law and uh, uh, we have the First Amendment and it doesn't even need to be um, a fig leaf or an excuse. It's actually a, a very virtuous system of content moderation um, and it can work great. So all you really need is the stomach uh, to defend that standard. Um, and we'll see if, if Elon Musk gives people the sort of backbone they need uh, to do the same. I think it's remarkable, but unsurprising that the left in terms of its uh, promotion of the idea of content moderation and so-called and social media platforms has shifted to a standard of harm and danger, which they essentially define as words they do not like or that are threatening to their agenda. But then when it comes to actual appearance of at least incitement to violence or violence itself, they're more than willing to call it mostly peaceful and more than willing to call it legitimate rhetoric. And what I think at core, what it shows is that 
from the administration that now has the disinformation governance board and a whole slew of other bodies that are focused on combating purportedly harmful information, but which at the same time doesn't go out and prosecute individuals who actually are threatening democracy in the way of the lives of Supreme Court justices or in their social media adjuncts. It's all so brazen. It's almost intentional at a certain point that it's in your face. It's obviously a bad faith effort and they're running amok because there is no counter to it. So you know, go back to, if you don't know what time it is, then you're never gonna compete here. And thank God for Elon Musk, uh, but the assault against him, as I've argued before, is gonna be vicious. It has been vicious already. What happens when you start having servers that potentially threaten to kick Twitter off or Twitter gets kicked out of the Apple store? Those are gonna be real defining tasks here in the social media realm. I'm hopeful that he will triumph, but it's yet to be seen. So we can open it up to final thoughts. And, you know, I think staying on this topic, because I just, I do think it's so significant. Um, you know, I, the parish I attend where I go to mass um, here around DC was completely locked down this Sunday. And, you know, the sort of uh, side doors were were locked. We had extra ushers, we had security, and apparently an email had gone out to the whole parish that like be prepared, right, for people to show up at your at your place of worship. And it just really drove home this issue with the left. Like this is not, you know, we can make comparisons to BLM, we can make comparisons to the riots, but this is so ingrained in the psyche of who they are. And, you know, I I I, I say this I don't say this lightly, and, and it was something that my priest said on Sunday where he said, this is literally demonic. You know, the fact that they, the lengths that they will go to, to ensure, you know, they'll, they'll cloak it in the, in the phrases of, of empowering women and choice and, you know, my body and all these things. But what it is, is literal murder and dismemberment of children in the womb. And this goes back, you know, if you were familiar with the Hebrew Bible, this goes back to Canaan, right? Like the, the, this idea, uh, you know, of, of, child sacrifice is rampant, uh, you know, throughout, throughout the Bible itself. And it, it really just drives home. I think the, the lengths the left is willing to go. And I don't think this is going to end, uh, soon. And it, it does concern me how the country will be ripped apart by this priority. You know, this is not something, you know, again, they'll hand wave about and fundraise off it. They'll do all those things, but it is really ingrained it seems in, in, and you see it in the nature of the protests itself. If you've walked down to the Supreme Court, I know Emily has, you know, been recording some of that for the Federalist. It is sick, you know, some of these slogans. It's not just about, you know, lighthearted approaches to policy. No, it is really profane uh, what is going on. And so, uh, you know, as conservatives, I think we need to buckle down because not to end on a like totally dire note, but I, I don't, I do think this issue is going to get worse. Um, and if you are the praying type, I think now's the time because <laughs> it is, it is a difficult um, time, I think. And, and it's honestly like been one of the most surreal experiences of my life to be <laughs> morbidly 35 weeks pregnant, listening to people, you know, talk about the ability to murder their child up until the ninth month, which is literally what Senate Democrats are voting on in the Senate today. Um, today. It, is, it is just galling and it is shocking. And at the same time, I'm also incredibly grateful to be here to witness the just, you know, Roe v. Wade be tossed onto the ash heap of history where it belongs. So it's a, it's a give and a take, I suppose. <laughs> They're, they're voting on it today and acting as though you hate women if you vote against it. Um, and, and that I think is, uh, if we're looking at sort of the problems with our culture, it's, it's not merely that they are voting on. The reason you have a bill like that is because we don't have discourse. We don't have legitimate discourse because of the coming apart phenomenon that Ben referenced earlier. Like that's the reason Democrats who are now run by the party of a man who said he was morally against abortion decades ago that's the reason why they have a, a disgusting, reprehensibly radical piece of legislation in the first place. But aside from that, they are now not only pushing this extremely radical bill, they are acting as though, and they're getting away with it because every single institution is, is lending credibility to this false claim that you are anti-woman, that you are barbaric 
if you disagree with it. It should be an extremely clarifying moment for everybody that uh, this this is a, if you're a, a person of faith, if you are a Christian, that if ever there is a time to live out uh, what Christ tells us, uh, what Paul tells us about not being a part of the culture um, of, of first Peter um, and, and how the culture is going to be against you. This is, this is that clarifying moment. They're talking about murdering babies and saying you're the, the barbaric one for opposing that up until the ninth month. That's all the clarification you should, should need as to where not the left is, but where our culture is right now, because this is not just the left. This is our, this is corporate America. This is the, the political establishment. This is the culture, a cultural establishment. And, and it's, it's right and it's it's naked. You can see it, um, and it should inform the way that we sort of treat these questions uh, across the board. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, Rachel's closing shot there was probably the closest I have come to shedding a tear on this podcast, honestly, because that was just so viscerally from the heart. Um, I, look, I mean, there's a reason that I've referred to abortion over and over again as the left's foremost pagan sacrament, because that's what it is. I mean, like, it, like they, they, that really is how they view it. It is like it is a fundamentally demonic or satanic approach to the taking of an innocent human life. I mean, there was a there was a cable news hit a few days ago where I, I think it was on, on MSNBC where they were literally laughing on air about creating a quote unquote love child for the sake of then aborting it just to prove a point. I mean, this is just. Uh, it's it's just so disgusting. I just don't really know how else to say it. But I want to tie together two things, which is the fact that they care so much about this, which um, uh, is at this point, obviously self-evident with what Emily and Ben were saying during my segment a couple of segments ago about kind of how the left views democracy, quad democracy in general. So uh, look, going back to Plato, okay, literally going back to Plato and the Republic, Plato argues that democracy and mobocracy are fundamentally, ultimately kind of the same thing, right? The founders understood this, obviously. That's why we have this elaborate system of, of separation of powers, federalism, checks and balances. The most famous quote there would be Madison, Federalist 51, if all men were angels, none of this would be, would be, would, would be necessary. Um, but the left obviously fundamentally disagrees with that. They view direct democracy as the, as, the, as the way it should be. That's why they try to abolish the Senate filibuster. That's why they're trying ultimately to eradicate the Electoral College. That's why they want, uh, you know, they think it's crazy that, that, that every state gets two votes. They want California to have way more votes. In every possible way that the framers kind of foresaw and kind of guarded against the excesses of human nature, they want direct democracy. And the reason for that is because might makes right is kind of the oldest way of thinking about politics going back to when men were in caves. So if you combine these two things, you combine kind of the way that they are so passionate about abortion with kind of a might makes right mentality, that's really dangerous. And again, I hate to kind of end on such a, 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 a dark note here, but that is really, really dangerous stuff. And I guess the only message that I could possibly say to people um, on, on our side, and you know, hope, hopefully Ben will end on a slightly slightly note that I'm about to say, is if you have not yet kind of trained with firearms and gotten accustomed to having protection, like when you walk around in your home or something of that nature, you know, in addition to praying, I think now would be a good time to start to look at, at those sorts of things. So I, I hate to kind of go there, but it really does seem like we are on the precipice sometimes of just some bad, bad stuff going on. I mean, look at the abortions or the pro-life center, excuse me, in Madison, Wisconsin, it looks like an act of arson, just evil stuff, honestly. I think it's a good kind of uh, Judeo-Christian mix of responses here to the onslaught that, that we're all witnessing and observing. Um, you know, I guess w one point that I would make is it really is remarkable to step back from a 30,000 foot perspective and think about how ardently and passionately the left is fighting to abort babies, to permit children to mutilate themselves in ways that can ruin their lives. Uh, and then, of course, the push to sexualize schools, including for people in third graders and below, in the case of the backlash you know, to the bill in Florida, uh, restricting gender identity and sexual orientation, uh, indoctrination essentially for those in third grade and below. Like this is what the left is fighting its unholy war over. And I think what it speaks to is, uh, it speaks to an assault on human nature, on our common sense, on, the basic tenets of civilization, the basics of human life. 
And how long can that kind of anti-human press persist and ultimately prevail is, is an open question here. And the reality is that regardless of how passionately they promote their ideology and the fact that they back it with force literally in the streets, the facts of life at the end of the day are conservative. And, I, and, those, and that does influence people, no matter how adult they've ultimately been from the indoctrination. So if we're gonna end it to some extent on a positive note, I, I guess I would say, let's pray that human nature prevails and that people see the disastrous consequences, the insanity of what's being put forth, the anti-civilizational nature of the shock troops who are backing it with force. I think people for a long time have been bullied into submission and quieted. They don't wanna go against the current thing uh, as it's been cast on Twitter and elsewhere. But at a certain point, it comes down to what kind of country do you want to live in? Do you want your children to live in? And I think most normal people look at this to the extent they see it and must recoil and be appalled at it. And you know, we'll have a chance to see as a proxy you know, in 2022 if there is that backlash and if some form of justice really is meted out at the ballot box. Not that I think the representatives on the purported other side of this issue are really with us on it, but nevertheless, people do have a chance to provide a modicum of self-correction here. And let's pray that that happens. But in the interim, I expect the pressure, the intimidation, and likely the violence to only get significantly worse because they feel that that is the only way ultimately that they can win. And we shouldn't cower in the face of that. We should stand up to it and speak boldly as I've argued before, boldly and honestly and courageously in the face of the mob rule that they're intending to impose upon us. Yeah, just to tie a bow on it so it's not, you know, completely <laughs> like depressing. I do think that even though this is, I think, a really dark time or could be for the country, you know, this is something that I think is also a privilege. It's a privilege, again, to be here to see the destruction of 50 years of, you know, state sanctioned murder in the womb. That's an honor. And it's also a privilege, I think, to be here to stand up and to speak the light of truth into darkness. You know, that's not something everybody gets to do in a very, very high stakes way uh, like we do now. So on that note, uh, on behalf of Ben, Josh and Emily, I'm Rachel Bovard. This is NatCon Squad and we will see you on, on the next episode.